Gregor Cerrone, a.k.a. The Big Fight Podcast, a show on the Loud Mouth MMA Podcast Network. I'm John Franklin. And I'm joined by Sherdog Cage Side Presses. Keith Schillen. Keith, how are you? I'm great, brother. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. This is the, this is the fun one. I mean, the other ones, uh, you know, we enjoy them all. But this is the one we get to dive way deeper into these yeah. uh, fights than anything else. So uh, uh, let's talk about this. So, Keith, the fights keep getting just bigger and bigger. And let me start by saying... Surprise, surprise, motherfucker. The king is back. He needed an opponent, and Dana White knew a guy. So with all the shtick out of the way, at least for now, Keith, I want to start with kind of an odd question, or maybe it's just an odd way to start. (laughs) Okay. Is this the most important fight that's booked in the UFC right now? Oh, most – that's a good question. So just just to give it back, I just want to talk about how I feel as a MMA fan. Like, we just got past the holidays. And you know when you get, like, warm? I, I like Christmas. I'm a Christmas guy. That's my favorite holiday. I like all the traditions. Like, we, me and boy, if we have a bunch of traditions, we go to a Christmas carol as a family every year. We, there's, a, there's a place near us that have these Christmas lights. We see, like, we, there's all these things. And you have that warm feeling. I feel the same way when Connor's fighting. Like, it feels like a holiday. It feels, this feels like Christmas week to me. And, like, you know, they, they, the... The press conference is a big deal. Like, I'm excited for the press conference. I'm excited for the early ways. I'm excited for the ceremonial ways. And it's so funny. I've been accused – this is what I love. I've been accused both ways. I've been accused of being a Conor McGregor nut hugger, as the, the old sure dog forum guys would say. And then I've been accused the other way of being the big Conor. Oh, you hate Conor. You're always negative about the guy in the mic. That, that's what I know. I feel like I'm right down the middle. Like I'm, I obviously got it. If, if the fans of Connor don't like how I view him, and if the haters of Connor don't like the way I view him, uh, back to is this the most important fight in the UFC right now? Whew, that's a good one because there's a. I mean, I just talked on my brand new show, MMA Takeover. I started off the first segment. I talked about how loaded the first quarter of 2020 is with uh, John Jones with Israel and Asanya fighting, with Habib and Tony fighting. But how is it not? How, how is the return of Conor McGregor not? He's the biggest star in the sport. This pay-per-view will, even though Tony and Habib's a better fight, this pay-per-view will do better numbers. I, I so mean, much hinges on this fight is what I think. Like, I'm not saying it's a better or worse fight than Khabib Tony. Uh, it's probably a worse fight than Khabib Tony. Um, although we, we'll get into yeah, that. Yeah, I agree. But I yeah, mean... Yeah. So much like these guys are two weight fighters. Connor's a two weight champion. Now he's coming up to 70. So if with a win, and we'll talk about all about what's next, but there's a lot that hinges on this fight in terms of the money for the UFC, in terms of where Cowboy's going, where Connor's going, where they're both divisions are going. I, I think it might be the most important fight, which, which is interesting. Yeah. I, I always feel this way. When I think about Connor, I think of like Derek Jeter with the Yankees. Derek Jeter wasn't the best player on the Yankees. There was always somebody better than whether it be A Rod, whether it be a pitcher, whether it be somebody. There was always someone better player. Wasn't Derek Jeter the most important? He was the the, the face of the organization. Like he was the one. If if you had a spokesman, like the leader, it was Derek Jeter. That's the right. same way with Connor. Yeah, Connor's to turn it the- over to the NFL in a way, it's like you know JJ Watt. These guys are kind of the face. Like Connor's the face. He's the, the face UFC of the UFC. One. Yeah. When people first think of the UFC, they know who Conor McGregor is. So I had, I, I had a, a buddy, a guy in my other job that I work with. We were talking about fighting. I don't remember who, a very popular fighter. He didn't recognize him. But as soon as I show Conor McGregor, yeah, of course I know Conor McGregor. You know, that's, the people, there are people who have never seen Conor fight who knows who he is. Like there's not many other people in the sport that can say that. Yeah, and, and Connor's almost a brand, and he's turned the UFC into a brand where, like, the thing that I think is the most amazing thing about the NFL is that it doesn't matter who you ask, someone that you ha- – everybody has a favorite team. Even if they don't watch football. Because I, I was at work the other day, and I asked some people, I was like, who's your favorite football team? And, they, and uh, one of my coworkers, she said, well, my dad likes the Giants, so I guess yeah. it's my favorite team. So everybody has a reason. So it's sure. the same thing with Connor. Like, he makes you – he makes the UFC relevant across all these different, you know, platforms and areas and demographics. You know, he's, he's got that polarizing figure thing down. He's, he's right down the middle. You got, everyone has an opinion about Conor McGregor. That's the best way to put it. Everyone has an opinion about him. Yeah. And being 
I mean, his back is against the wall in this fight. If he doesn't win, I mean, this would be the worst loss in his UFC career. He'll be set back a big, big ways. I mean, fans have – the hardcore fans have really turned against him. You know, casual fans might turn against him. Like, if, if, you've, if you bought the, you know, the Mayweather pay-per-view and saw him lose, you buy the Habib pay-per-view, see him lose, and now you buy this pay-per-view and see him lose, that'd be three pay-per-views in a row that he lost. So, yeah, his back is against the wall. Absolutely. All right, let's move on to the origin story. And, guys, we're going to get through the origin story somewhat quickly. In the past, we've gone through all the fights and everything like that. I, I'm going to kind of get us as quickly as we can to the presser, where they were both at, as quickly as we can to the Dos Anjos fight kind of falling apart and the role Donald Cerrone played in that. But, again, round one is origin story, so let's get into that. So let's start with Donald Cerrone. He really, you know – his name was made in the WEC a long, long time ago. This is when the WEC had the best 155-pound fighters in the world. Uh, he fought Jamie Varner. He fought Benson Henderson. He fought Razor Rob McCullough. He fought all these guys, and he was a champion in the WEC. And that's sort of – that coupled with Tap Out is kind of where his name was made, when it was still those three guys from Tap Out. And I think they had a TV show. He was uh, featured on that. That's kind of where you got to know Donald Cowboy Cerrone. And then as the WEC made its way to the UFC – Cerrone became this guy who sort of uh, represented, um, you know, represent kind of where, where Matt Hughes left off, Donald Cerrone picked up. If you were a working class kind of guy, if you were a blue car, collar kind of guy. And the interesting thing about uh, Cowboy is, and we'll get into this a little bit later, uh, potentially, is that he kind of had this like extreme sports part of him too. So he was pulling those guys in and he was pulling the country boys in. And uh, so that's kind of where, he was right so obviously he had his first title shot uh, in terms of the UFC against Rafael Dos Anjos the fight was all Dos Anjos's and then this is kind of where as Connor's making his ascension as well kind of came over from cage warriors and he's having these uh high profile fights and, and going through the ranks pretty quickly you know the Connor's story's been told a thousand times where they come to an apex is or I'm sorry as a where they come to a uh crossroads is Rafael Dos Anjos. So Connor was booked to fight Rafael Dos Anjos. The fight fell through, and there were three fighters who were potential opponents for Connor. It was Uriah Faber, Donald Cerrone, and the person he ultimately fought, which was Nate Diaz. So talk to me about these two guys in their early careers and kind of get us right up to where we're at. <clears throat> yeah, so the, the thing I just want to talk about, I want to talk about their personalities. Because, and this is why I think it's actually fascinating, because this, if you're an MMA fan, you probably fall in one of the two categories. You either like the big trash talk, you like the larger than life, you like that part of the sport, the sport that has become mainstream, the sport that you're, you know, you're on ESPN, you're talking to uh, – Conan O'Brien, you're making appearances different places, you could be a Hollywood actor, like you like that mainstream stuff thing. And that's all Connor. The commercials, the the showing up, the three piece. Remember you used to always say when you first coming up, you know, anytime you could wear a three piece suit, you should kind of thing. Yeah. That's him. But Donald Cerrone is that true roots of the sport, if you know what I mean, like Remember those t- those those time when it wasn't a mainstream thing, where it was like a, 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 a. I remember, I remember like it was yesterday. I was at a Six Flags, and I saw. And you're funny, you said tap out. I saw a guy wear a tap out shirt, and this is before they really blew up. And I went up to him, and we were like, I was like, you know, when the lines like kind of turn, and like the people that are twelve people ahead of you, that suddenly you could be next to each other as the lines for the roller coaster. You know what I'm talking about? And they weave yeah. in and out. Mm-hmm. So suddenly me and this guy were right next to each other. And I was like, hey, man, that's a cool shirt. Like, are you are you an MMA fan? And he's like, yeah, yeah. And we started talking to the point where the guy let people cut him so we would be next to each other to talk because it was like a cult. It was like, like that secret society. It was like Fight Club that no one else knew. Like, Cerrone reminds me of that before it was mainstream. I mean, Donald Cerrone is a guy that wears jeans and a T-shirt. He's a guy that you know, he, he wants, I mean, you look at the countdown shows, he's riding uh, snowmobiles with his son on the back. Like he's not drinking champagne, riding in Rolls Royce, you know, that's Connor. So their, their personalities are so different. 
even the way they present themselves, Connor loves the trash talk. Now he's he's taken a much different angle for this fight. But his rise, part of his rise was his he'd say it, then do it. Well, Cerrone's never that guy. Cerrone's one of the guy like I fight anybody, anytime, anywhere, but it was always respectful. Remember when he fought Alex Hernandez and Alex Hernandez was trying to trash talk? Like Cerrone was like, come on, dude, I'm too old for that. I don't need that. Like, why are you trying to trash talk? Remember that? Yeah. That, so like their personalities is so different, but Wix is so great. Like when you have the 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 Conor McGregor, the whiskey he compared to the Budweiser, like even that, even to the liquor, like one's a liquor guy, the other guy's a bear guy. Like I, this is what I love about this, like just how different they are, um, and how quick the, uh, Conor McGregor rose to start him, and how long it has taken Cerrone to all these appearances, fighting everybody, you know. It's just great. Now I don't even remember what the original question was. I don't know what I wanted to rant. Well, no, I, I, there wasn't really a question. I guess I guess what yeah. I found interesting was that you know I used to have this thing, and and you know we try our best not to interject ourselves in this because this is high stakes fighting, and you know we are you know you fought before, but like street fighting and stuff like that. But I remember. Yeah, but go ahead. I just told the story about six flags. So go that's ahead. true. Well, here's here's my intersection, which I, why I thought this was interesting, and we'll get to the go big presser here in a second. But one one point of intersection that I had not brought up was they both fought on UFC 178. Poirier fought Connor and um, Cerrone fought Alvarez in the main event. So there's footage out there of like, you know, Poirier and, and Connor kind of getting into it. And it then Cerrone being much more subdued. I think it was a co-main event. Right. No, I'm saying Connor and Poirier came out first. Oh, and then, no, I think, I think Cerrone and, Alvarez was co-main event. Oh yeah, yeah. I apologize, but what I mean is that uh, they were they came out way, after Connor and Poirier. The video of them actually going back, like Cerrone and and McGregor meeting each other back then, like talking to each other. Like I think they even, they even took a picture together. Right. They're being very cordial because remember they were in different weight classes. Yeah, but they so this is where I'm talking about where it got interesting. So they intersected that day, and it was interesting because you know Donald Cerrone was not a stranger to uh, a weigh-in where there were some words exchanged or like remember when Nate Diaz flipped his cowboy hat off so he'd been in those before but Connor and Poirier were so crazy that Cerrone even said how am I supposed to follow that and then him and he was up there with Eddie and they just kind of shake hands but here's my point goes back to my point about how different they were right but, but here's my thing I remember when I was younger I would go to parties and I would always get to the party and go that's the guy I'm gonna have a problem with and if I stay at this party long enough, we're bound to run into each other. We're bound to cross paths. I just know that we're too different, me and that guy. And sure. I would usually end up getting in a fight with the guy. I mean, that's just how it was when I was in my 20s. <laughs> I remember when that presser happened and even how Connor was handling himself at that time. He was talking all this shit. And you would always say, man, he won't say that with this guy around or he won't say that with that guy around. And he always would. He'd get away with, with Aldo, right? Dustin Poirier wasn't quite sure. who he is now. But then in that presser, it was like, will he talk shit about these 55ers with Cowboys sitting there? And he did. And that's when the, they went back and forth. You know, Connor was like, you guys are all stuck in the mud. And then Cowboy was saying, listen, you're about to get your ass whipped by Aldo. This yeah. was their first real intersection where it was like, okay, I could sort of see a fight between these two guys. We know Connor's yeah. not afraid to jump weight. Mm-hmm. Cowboys, you know, that's where I think it got interesting. And that's where it was like these two guys who could have avoided each other but could potentially be on a collision course yeah. finally collided. To me, that is the brilliance of Conor McGregor. Say what you want. He's made some really dumb choices in his personal life, which we're going to have to cover. But business-wise, he has made some brilliant decisions. In the early stages of his rise, to be sitting at – that. it was called the Go Big Press Conference. It was uh, – Oh, God, like three years ago. No. September 4th, 2015. There you go. September 4th, 2015. The go big press conference. And to sit there and pretty much put himself against every single person on there. It, it didn't become Connor versus Jose Aldo. It became Connor versus Jose Aldo and Rafael Dos Santos, Donald Cerrone, Frankie Edgar, Chad Mendez, whoever. He did, it, he did it another time with uh, Jeremy Stevenson one for UFC, was it 205, where he turned yeah. back and who the hell, you know, who the F is that guy? You know, so he, that was the brilliance of that he always had, like, backup plans. He always setting up future. Like, he was laying seeds that is blossoming, what, what did you say, almost, you know, four and a half years later, five years yeah. later? Like, think about that. That's brilliant. If that didn't happen, 
who knows like would be would be as would be as exciting as it is now I well, you talk the- about the things that he's always been planting seeds you talk about the video of him kind of squaring off with tyron woodley that never came to fruition but if yeah. woodley keeps the belt if woodley's the champion right now that has some relevance yeah how about the yeah you know, even the guys he's beaten the when max holly won a big fight he he, he showed the you know, he showed the picture of how he beat up. And he's like, oh, I missed those sunglasses. You know, the ones, you know, like different things reminding people that he beat Max Holloway. The little things he does. I mean, he's he's a brilliant guy. So I just want to I, – I wrote down some quotes of the back and forth between Connor and, and Cerrone in this. You know, he says – Connor called him too stiff and too slow. And then uh, Cerrone says, like, too big and too strong. Uh, at one point, Cerrone says, I'll bend him over. And, and and kick the lucky charms out of him. Yeah. He called him an Englishman, which was kind of funny. But my favorite part of the whole press conference had nothing to really even do with Connor. It was when Donald Cer- – oh, I mean, he was talking to Connor, and he says, sit down, which he was sitting down. But and he goes, you beat nobody. But the best part, right to Donald Cerrone's left, one person over is Chad Mendes. Yeah. Who Connor's last fight was a victory over. Right. I was like, damn. Damn, Donald, nothing like smashing your boy. You know, yeah, you and then over. Connor does the yeehaw. It was this. It was yeah. a great moment. People forget that was the red panty night presser. Yes. Like this is yeah, kind yeah. of what Connor and 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 table. everyone always thinks about Rafael dos Santos. That comment was to Rafael dos Santos, but it was to both of them because the question was: You said that they're fighting for the title. That either one would give up to get a chance to fight him. Rafael dos Santos begins to start the answer, and he's basically saying. You know, they actually, they both look, Cerrone and, and Rafael looked at it like, who's the answer first? Like, Cerrone gives it, like, go ahead. Rafael starts answering it. He gets five seconds in, basically, like, I'm just focused on Donald at this point. And then kind of jumps in, like, you know, you know, answer the question. You know, you'd, you'd take it from me. You'd call up your wife. It'd get out the red panties, you know. And he even goes, gives him an out a little bit where he says anybody would. I'm the, I'm the big money fight. I'm the big money shit in all weight divisions is the quote. And that's, I mean, that's kind of what he was at the time. Let me ask this, because you always like to ask me a question. Let me ask you a question. Is that still true today? Is he still, does, does everybody give up the opponent to face Connor? Right now, even yeah. after a loss? Well, pre, pre this fight. And that's why I think this fight is so huge. Pre this fight, yeah, he's the biggest fight in the world. Okay. And if he wins, then it, it, it's even more true. Right. And if he wins a spectacular fashion. And, I mean, you can make a case that if he loses, it still is. I mean, he's still, he's still a money fight. Yeah. But, I mean, in comparison to everyone else, he's not, yeah. a, he's not a money fight. Now, Connor's so huge that yeah. it was, it's funny. And, and this goes a lot to the backstory, and we'll get more into Cerrone in a second. But Connor's so huge, he almost had to go to boxing in a way. He had almost outgrown the sport. Now, where there's still fights in I MMA still think he has. I still think he has. Yeah. Like, he has to pass, I think – Connor is bigger than the UFC. I mean, does the UFC need him? No, I don't believe that. But it, he he doesn't need the UFC either. Like he's you know, he showed that by going getting that Mayweather fight. Right. You know, that wasn't made by the power of Dana White and the Fertitta brothers and Endeavor and all that. That was made by the power of Conor McGregor. Well, yeah, and I mean just think about it. If you were to infuse Connor, an active Connor, right? In a in a promotion that you know he's he's fighting cans. And we beat them all. Like if all of a sudden Connor was in Bellator, everything about Bellator changes. Their it's financial so- situation changes. I mean, now what it would take to get him financially is a whole different story. But what you say, he's a game changer in that way. Is he bigger than UFC? You can make an argument because if he went somewhere else, now things change. Yeah. You know, now everything, the, the whole dynamics of the world changes. So the few things I want to touch on both these guys, um, you know, when you talk about Cerrone in, in terms of origin story and backstory, if you will, the active fighter, all the records, uh, the one question I want to ask you, which may be better suited for breakdown, but I have to ask it now because it's part of the origin story. This whole, I call it the cow dad. This whole <laughs> cow dad business. Do you think he's a better fighter since he's, his son was born? Or do you think he's I fighting spoke, lesser? I spoke with this to Ben Duffy on, on the first episode of the MMA Takeover, the newest show on the Loudmouth Family Podcast Network. Uh, and I, I don't believe that narrative. I believe he fought lower, lesser opponents. I feel like the narrative became true because he fought Mike Perry and he fought Alex Hernandez. When he fought Tony Ferguson and, and Justin Gaethje, it wasn't true. So, no, I do not believe that. I think it was just the perfect timing So and, and having the right opponents so it made it seem like he was just – and it was a creative, it was a creative narrative. It, it, well, and the three, guys he, the three guys that he beat 
you could make a case were, tr- are, were or are trending down. But at the time, they were perceived differently than they are now. Mike Perry has not been the same fighter he was since he fought uh, Donald Cerrone. Alex Hernandez was maybe a little bit early. And I quit to seems to be kind of trending down. So Yeah, I forget about I quit. That's, the best, that's your best argument. How right, but well it all he- went to that narrative. Because I believe Cerrone came into the Iaquinta fight as the underdog. Probably, yeah. Uh, not the huge, but he was an underdog, I believe. So that is your, if you're going to make that argument that the motivation of the son changed something in him, that Iaquinta fight is the perfect. That's it's the strongest the, argument for it, yeah. And then the weakest one is the Perry's and the uh, one. Um, are we are we going to get to how this actual, like we've already talked about, how about how, 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 Cerrone got picked. Let's talk about it. Okay. So it all started with a tweet going back to the Alex Hernandez fight. After he beat Alex Hernandez, Connor tweeted out, it was January 19th, 2019. So it was exactly one year and one day from the fight on Saturday. So just over a year ago. Oh, no, sorry. No, let me back that. It's it's less than one day of a year, so does it's been a year that this has been put in motion. Connor tweeted, "For a fight like that, Donald, I'll fight you. Congratulations!" And uh, that's put all the machinery to work. That's when the we started seeing the the proper twelve and the Budweiser and, and all these different things that getting put in place. And and after every single fight of Donald Cerrone, who should he fight next? Connor's name was always the one. When he beat Ali Quinta, that was when it hit the peak. When he beat Ali Quinta, I think everyone was saying, you know, Connor has to be the guy. And then, you know, there was people saying he shouldn't be taken. Remember people saying he, he shouldn't have took the Ali Quinta fight? People were like, why would, you, why would you risk, you know, missing out on Connor if you lose to Ali Quinta? And then he gets past Ali Quinta, and everyone's like, oh, thank God he got past Ali Quinta. Now he has to get the fight. And then he gets Tony Ferguson, like, what are you doing, man? Oh, I guess he's going to try to get the title instead. Like, you know, and people would think that was a bad choice. And he ended up. No, I remember that. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because I remember that it was a decision for Cowboy. What is the direction you're going to go in? Are you going to go chase this, you know, and and this is a horrible pun that I'm about to use, but are you going to chase the pot of gold, the iris, the leprechaun? I get it, guys. Um, But are you going to chase the pot of gold, which is Conor McGregor, or are you going to chase um, the title? And fighting Tony Ferguson is a decision to chase the title. And I, even fighting Justin Gaethje is a decision to, t- to chase the title. And, and, now, and now, was he biding time waiting for Connor? Because Connor was going to come back when Connor came. He's going to come back. That's who he is in the sport. Maybe. But, you know, he was still on a, on a, uh, a championship trajectory. Even after Tony, I think, because yeah. of the way the Tony fight ended. Yeah, when he lost to Tony, a lot of people thought he, he, he blew his chance to get Connor. A lot of people felt like, oh, you blew your chance. But it's funny because before that fight, that's exactly what he was saying. Like, he was saying, like, money comes and go, but leg- legacy lasts forever. And that's, like, the one thing he was missing. And he's made a lot of money. Obviously not Conor money, but he's made a lot of money. He hasn't had that title in the UFC. That's the only thing he's really kind of missing. Right. So, yeah. And, guys, obviously Keith, should, Keith said there that he blew his chance. You know, he blew his nose in the Tony fight. We're full of puns tonight. Yeah. All right, so, <laughs> and somehow uh, he got so let me ask you this question. Do you think, so now with the UFC decided, because there was a couple, there was a lot of options, and I was saying this to Ben the other day, the, for the first time in a really long time, there was a, with B, Connor not being, having the title, not really in the title picture, not in the line somewhere, there was a lot of options for him. Do you think Cerrone was the right choice? I do. Okay. And I think Cerrone is, while he is a well-rounded fighter, of Connor's options, uh, depending on how you feel about Justin Gaethje, I'm high on Justin Gaethje. I think Cerrone was the most beatable. So okay. I, I think, and that's what he, I think that Cerrone was the biggest name that was the most beatable. Okay. That's what Connor needed. He needed a big name. Mm-hmm. He needed someone that you think can beat him, but probably can't. And I have an interesting question for you when we get to uh, the breakdowns and all that about, about in terms of on their best night type stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, before we move on from the uh, – well, let, me, let me say this a little quick, quick because I had four reasons why I 100% agree with you that I think Donald Cerrone was the best choice. I think he was the most obvious choice. And I'll tell you, I had four reasons, four things. You've kind of said two of them. One is he is a name. So I always categorize like fight fans. There is the super casual, the ones who only tune in for – 
Donald Cerrone, I mean, excuse me, Conor McGregor, Brock Lesnar, maybe John Jones, like the, you know, the mega, mega, mega stars. Then I have like the MMA fans, which are the guys who will, they'll watch a lot of pay-per-views. They might watch a fight night, but they're not watching every single thing. They're not watching WEC. I mean, sorry, uh, obviously not watching WECs. LFAs, and they're not watching. They're missing majority belt cards. And then you have the hardcores: you, me, all the guys on the network, Marcel, the you know the people who tune in every single card. You know, they're watching podcasts. Like, like if you you could say you're an MA fan, but you don't know who Luke Thomas are, then you're not a, at least you're not a hardcore fan. Like, you should right. know who Luke Thomas is. You know, so. I feel like Cerrone is not a name in that casual. The casual fans might not know who Donald Cerrone is, but that next tier definitely does. You know, they know the accomplishments with Donald Cerrone. They know, like, oh, this guy is willing to fight everybody all the time. So he's, he's a name in that sense. Well, I think also you talk about d- degrees of separation, right? Like, where does somebody know somebody from? Like, you may not know Donald Cerrone, but how many – how long would it take me to explain to you who he is? Yeah, exactly. And if it doesn't take that long for me to explain to you who he is, he's, you know, like you said, he's right outside huh? the the full casual. And, you know. and what happens, I, I know that happens to you, it probably happens to all of us, when Conor McGregor gets a fight, uh, Nate Diaz, whoever gets a fight, you get a call, you get a text, you get something from the casual, and, hey, who's this guy who's fighting? And you go, oh, Donald Trump, oh, is this it? Is this it's just like they're just throwing it. Who's Donald Cerrone? He's like, oh no, he's only the most. N- nobody in the history of the sport has more wins than Donald Cerrone. More right. stoppages in the history of the UFC. And then they go, oh wow, like oh, so he's a real, real threat. Which gets to my second and third point. I, which you've already said, Donald Cerrone is a very winnable fight for Conor McGregor. However, which goes to my third point, he's a very big threat to Donald to, uh, to Conor McGregor. So he fits both categories. You want you don't want to. Tossing out tomato cans at him, the right. no setup, but he should be favored. He should win. So that's why the second, third, and then the fourth one. I just think Donald Cerrone deserves it, being that he's fought everybody. He's been the ultimate company man. He has these records. If anybody before the end of his career deserves a mega fight, deserves that fight that maybe in the rankings doesn't even make that much sense, or someone like Justin Gaethje who's high in the rankings who just beat him, probably deserves it more. If you're ever going to sell it to someone, Donald Trump is that guy. You know what is funny? This might take a little bit more research to do, but off the top of my head, uh, you know, they take care of the company, man. I'll give you the example. Michael Bisping got GSP. They tried to give DC, Brock. This is kind of that for yeah. Donald Cerrone. Mm-hmm. Now, listen, you, you, if you're going to win the fight or not, that's up to you. But, you know, Bisping lost his. Obviously, we, we believe Cormier would have won, but it never came to fruition. But it's like, hey, we're going to put you in there. We're going to give you, you know, and I think maybe what we can start calling it moving forward is this is the gold fight, the gold, uh, gold watch fight, right? You get the gold watch. It's almost towards the end. Here's your gold watch. Thank you for your service. You get to fight Connor. Yeah. You fight Brock. You get to fight GSP. You yeah. know, we had a lot of good years. We shared some laughs. And even, retirement. And even going back to you, you made a good point with Michael Bissing. Even if you go back to Michael Bissing, when, when, Luke Rockhold was needed opponent on week's notice. You think Michael Bisping, who was lower down on the middleweight rankings, would have been the only guy to step up and take that fight? There was other guys higher ranked than him that would have probably jumped at that opportunity too. So, hey, I, I get to skip the line and get a title fight. I'll take that. But because Michael Bisping is the ultimate coming guy, you know he's going to show up. You're going to try to put on a show. So yeah, I think that's I think that's a good. I mean, how many times has Don, they called up Donald Cerrone and he's taken the fight? Yeah. So yeah, he he deserves probably it. every time. <laughs> and if it wasn't, if it was, if Justin Gaethje beat, say, uh, let me just think of a name. Say Justin Gaethje just beat Ally Quinter, and then they gave the fight to Ally Quinter, there'd be outrage over it. But because it's Donald Cerrone and everything he's done, I don't think there is that outrage. There 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 isn't a lot of people complaining that Cerrone got the matchup, right? All right, last thing I want to talk about. Okay. I want to talk about one more thing too. But Go ahead. I want to talk about. Well, I'm sure I mean, you might be going this hour, anyways. But we have to talk about everything that has happened in Connor's life since his last fight. Is that what that's you're what going I was going to talk about? So I got the list here. Let's that's why you're the best. That's so just so people know, we don't really talk about what we're going to talk about, which is I think is the best because then it becomes more natural. Like we know we're going to talk about breaking down the fight. Right. But, yeah. So here's my list, and if I'm missing anything, you let me know. So we got the Bellator in cage incident. We got the Irish Mafia issue. 
the strong arm robbery of the cell phone, threw the dolly at the bus, the post fight brawl against Khabib, hit the guy in the bar. I mean, that's what I got. We got the sexual uh, allegations, the sexual uh, uh, assault. So this is now, okay, I'm going to take a weird turn on this. Has all this stuff really hurt Connor? Like, really? Or has it sort of, I mean, listen, he is the notorious Connor McGregor. Does this help that brand? Does it hurt that brand? Did he not? I mean, he didn't need it. Yeah. But I'm asking, does it really hurt him? I mean, it kept him out of the cage, but the money might have kept him out of the cage, Keith. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, the money, yeah. The UFC doesn't care about this shit. Like, let's be honest. Uh, I mean, the but does it help him in terms of the fans? Does it make him a more either polarizing uh, figure? Does I, it make him a bigger star? I think he turned some people away from him. Not, he didn't turn the amount of people away from that he should have, but he did turn some people away from him. But like anything, and you know me, I'm not a political person, left or right, but there's certain, if you like the president, the people who really like the president will defend everything they, he says and does. They'll spin it, they'll, just like the people who dislike the president will find something good he does and find a way to hate on it. The guys who support Conor McGregor, they've been the con. They're gonna support him no matter what. Like, uh, he, you know, the old man should have dogged. He didn't even hit him as hard as he, you know, he he was kind of off balance. The Conor was drunk. Uh, the fan, you know, you know, the fan who stole his phone. You know how it is with the fans. Uh, you know, imagine if you had the phone put in your face all the time. You know, he, uh. Oh, the sexual allegations, which who knows are the true or false, and neither one of us is saying whether it's true or false. I feel the same way. If it's false, then shame on those people who are lying, and if it's true, then Connor needs to be put in jail. Right. I think I can speak for you, me, and everyone on the, net, on yeah. the network. So um, the thing that bothers me is what we just saw. I understand the strategy of it, but – See what just happened with Ariel Hawani, and he did the interview with Connor before the press conference. Why are we having a press conference? Why are we having a 45-minute sit-down interview with Ariel Hawani? Well, the reason why we're doing a 45-minute interview instead of a five-minute interview where he just asked about controversy is be, to, to seem like, oh, we didn't do this just to cover a quick controversy so we don't have to talk about the press conference. But they did that so when the press conference come, if anybody – any media member has the guts to ask Connor about the two sexual assault allegations that's supposedly an ongoing investigation right now, he can say, I just answered these questions this week. Right. hundred percent. I'm not going to answer. But also what I thought was, is, is Ariel asks the question, Connor knows it's coming because that's the whole reason, but he doesn't even mention sexual assault allegations. He just says, you know, all these things that's in the news about you. I was like, like, is there a more obvious like, plan by ESPN and the McGregor's team, the UFC, everybody together to show like, how obvious that Ariel would even say the word sexual assault allegations? Yeah, I mean, and the other part that I found that's embarrassing. interesting. Yeah, the other part I found interesting was how Ariel almost handed him the answer when he goes, do you echo what your management – and your whatever said that you would deny these claims. Like he made sure that Connor remembered that his management and whomever is already, his legal team has sure. already said that you deny it. Don't forget that Connor, that you've already, you, you know, your, your, your legal team's already said that, yeah. you know, so I get, I mean, listen, I get where Errol's coming from. And listen, I, I come at this from a different, from a different uh, perspective. I do think it is the job of the media to ask those questions. There's a part of me that's glad Errol got him out of the way. I'm going to be honest with you because I'm not tuning into that press conference to find out about Connor's sexual assault allegations. I'm really yeah. not. That's not why I would, I would watch the press conference. Yeah. And let's be honest. If anybody asks a question at the press conference, we all know if you ask a question, you know, you're not going to get an answer. You just want to be the person who asked. Right. So you can say Looking you did. Me, I asked. And right. everyone's like, Oh my God, he risks losing his credit, whatever. Yeah. But I want to back up because, it's embarrassing. Like, for example, the Aaron Rodgers has a football game on Sunday. If there was rumors, of, uh, if there was any allegations about sexual assault, he would be asked it. The Green Bay Packers would be asked about it. 
Mike, uh, who's the coach of the Packers now? I almost said Mike McCarthy. Whoever the coach of the Packers, I don't know, who is, would be asked about it. His teammates would be asked about it. They'd be asking Devontae Adams and I don't know who else his team. I almost said Jordy Nelson. He's not there. But you know what I mean. They, all his teammates would be getting asked about it. Like everybody right. would be the biggest thing. But because in MMA we're protected, the, it, the media has no power that we get these these kind of questions by Arrow that he doesn't even say the words. That said, I want to say it's absolutely brilliant by the UFC, by ESPN, and by Connor's team to set this up. Yeah, it's true. So, I mean, I, it's, it's, I'm embarrassed as a, from the media sense, but it, absolutely great marketing. I mean, great uh, – what's the word I'm looking for? Um, PR control? Yeah, 100%. So, as soon as someone stands up on, on Saturday, either Dana White or Connor himself, say, man, I already asked those questions. I already answered those questions this week. Yeah. And uh, just so you guys know, Matt LaFleur is the coach of the Green Bay Packers. I'm only saying that. Not to correct Keith, but I know podcast listeners are insane, and you're probably sitting in your cars right now Googling who the head coach is. Get back to listening to us. It's Matt LaFleur. All right, so let's move yeah, on. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a, I, I, no, you're I'm good. I wanted to make sure guy. that they knew I'm that we knew. Guy, but I'm a, I am a New England Patriots fan, and that's who I really pay attention to. I, don't, they, I couldn't think of the second wide receiver for the Packers. <laughs> well, that, that they could Google if they want. All right, let's move on. Let's start breaking these guys down. Let's start with Conor McGregor. Uh, in the past – we have done just a straight uh, scouting report on your part. And I don't want to venture too far away from that because I know you do the tape study and I know you really have a good handle on who these guys are. I have some questions uh, after you do the breakdown. So we'll get to the breakdown and then – I'm sorry, we'll get to the scouting report and then we'll get to the questions. Let's start with Conor McGregor. Talk to me about what Conor, uh, what Conor McGregor is all about in the cage. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll talk the- – it's too simple to call him just a striker because he's not just a striker, but that obviously is his strength. Conor McGregor is one of the best strikers in the UFC, and anybody who says otherwise is just a Conor McGregor hater. Uh, obviously, he's a southpaw. I'm impressed by how calm he is on the feet. He doesn't tense up. Um, when he's in there, he's in control. On the feet, he, you know, he's he's all off. I mean, he he he. What I should say, he leads the dance. Uh, he has he's the master of range. He gets right to where he wants. He's perfect at slipping a punch just, just enough just to get off the center line to leave himself inside position to land his own massive shot. He is unbelievable at vision. He seems – he keeps his head – when he moves away from shots, he keeps his eyes on the target where he land. He has great precision, incredible power. I mean, look at the Nate Diaz fight. Going up a weight class against, you know, at – you know, Let's be honest, Manny Diaz is a lightweight fighting at welterweight, but a big lightweight, a guy who's been known for his toughness. And Khan is dropping him with punches. His straight left hand is deadly. Um, but the way the people who said he's just a left hand, it has really missing the things. While his left hand is definitely his go-to, that's what he looks for the most. His setups are fantastic. He, he distracts with the right hand. He moves the right hand. He, he, he fights with your hands. He'll go to the body with the right hand. All just getting you thinking and looking for the openings. And he's reading. He's studying to land that left hand and put him out. Uh, he works the body really well. Even his, his most success against Habib was in the third round. Anytime he ever – and he didn't, like, make Habib hurt. But anytime he beat – Step back and had to regather himself was from body punches from from Conor and that and to me that was was his best work uh, and I think he has very underrated kicking game the teep kicks he was throwing at at Chad Mendes Chad Mendes has gone a wreck and I talked about how much that hurt him uh, it's something that I just watched the breakdown uh, the Dan Hardy breakdown who had Dan Hardy's fantastic at it he talked about that that Chad Mendes talked about that it wasn't even his punches it was his teeps that that really surprised him. And then his leg kicks. You look at the Nate Diaz kick. He was taking Nate Diaz apart with the leg kicks, and, and Nate turned into an ugly fight, and Connor kind of got away from that strategy. But in the fourth round, when after he dropped the third round, when he regathered himself, he went back to the leg kicks. Now, that's all the good things he does. He does some bad things on the feet. He drops his right hand. Like He'll throw a jab, and he brings it down to his waist, which he hasn't been punished for that yet. But the way – Cerrone throws the high kick from that side. It like it wouldn't. I mean, I would. It would surprise me if he lands the high kick and knock him out. But I wouldn't be like, oh my god, that 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 wasn't 
Kevin Random and thrown that left hook that knocked out Mer- Merkel Krokop surprise or, or Matt, Matt Serra's, you know, right hand. Um, he doesn't like to be in pressured. He likes when he leads. He doesn't like backing up. You know, anytime he, you know, the Nate Diaz is the perfect example of both the second and, I mean, the first, uh, the first and second fight. And he has such a wide stance, which generates his power. But because of that, he's open to the leg kicks, which no one has really taken advantage of, which is why a lot of people think Justin Gaethje is a bad matchup, stylistic matchup, because of how much weight Connor puts on his front leg, which obviously the more weight you put in your front leg, the more likely you're going to be to get kicked. Um, on the ground, he's got no offensive wrestling. He, like, he, he doesn't look to wrestle. I mean, we saw him shoot in the Nate when, fight when he was hurt, but he's not a wrestler. Um, he gets taken down a lot. Chad Mendes took him down a lot, but he, well, I originally wrote down takedown defense was bad. I actually thought in some moments against Habib, he showed good takedown defense. Everyone talked about, like I was talking to this guy, Bruno, and, and I respect this Bruno Duar. He's right with the MA takeover. Um, he, he was going for a, like you saying, he was going for a switch. And it was like, well, Khabib is so d- deep. You can't, you can't, like he's in a high crotch. You can't sprawl. And I was trying to explain to him. But he was doing things. Like he didn't just fight. He had great hip control. And he made, even though Khabib took him down, he made Khabib work for that takedown. And a lot of wrestlers, um, a lot of wrestlers would have struggled to get that down. Um, and then obviously is the cardio. In the second Nate fight, the cardio got to him. I don't think the cardio really got to him in the in the Habib fight. I think that's just more Habib style. But we haven't seen him like even in the second Nate fight, he kind of got tired in the second round. He got a second win late, and that which helped him win the fight. But cardio is an issue too. So sorry, I know that was a very long time, but that's my entire rap sheet and Conor McGregor. No, I liked it. So here's you know I heard an interesting quote about Conor. I want to get your thoughts on it. And the quote was. He spends 10% of the time throwing the left hand and 90% of the time making you forget about it. I like that. Mm, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, he does it with the kicks in the right hand. Right. So he's, he's always working towards – and we talked about a comparison of guys like this with, like, Chuck Liddell. Chuck Liddell would try and walk you into the right hand. Connor kind of does it with the left. I do think – you know, I think one thing that's gotten forgotten with all this Floyd Mayweather business and all this could be business, and, and we're going to get to in the predictions – You know, again, and I'm not the first person to say this, and I won't be the last. You know, he lost a boxing match to Floyd Mayweather, arguably the best boxer of all time. He lost uh, uh, what amounted to a grappling match with Khabib Nurmagomedov, one of the greatest grapplers of all time. Maybe the best ever. Yeah. Right. So the two things that get forgotten in those two fights that are his, you know, most recent work is that there was a time when we talked about Conor McGregor as like the future of movement. And I'm not talking about the touch button, the park, yeah, and all that shit. Yeah. I'm talking about that, you know, him, Dominic Cruz. We thought these guys, uh, at the time, TJ Dillashaw, at the time, a little bit, Cody Garbrandt. We're like, these guys are the future of movement, right? And how a guy's going to fight in the – and all that's got lost because he was in there in, the, in a boxing match where he didn't – that didn't really come into play. And he got taken down a bunch. I think that movement's still present. And I think that it's more uh, relevant against a fighter like Cerrone than it would have been against a fighter like Khabib. So uh, that, to me, makes this fight very interesting. So now here's my questions. Yeah. So can I, can I just – I just want to jump on Go one ahead. thing about that. The thing that gets me why Habib – obviously the wrestling aspect, but why Habib – Connor's the master of the kicking range in. Habib was shooting even beyond that. And so, so where Connor's the master of Habib was fighting beyond it. Like in the first round, Habib shot from a mile away, but only Habib gets that takedown. Right. Oh, and which why later on in the second round, the reason why – and then people like – I think Connor has – I didn't say it. I think Connor has a great chin. He's never really been hurt. Even when Nate was teeing off on him, he ate them all. Like he, he seemed more tired than hurt. And, and not that Nate is a big power puncher, but Chad Mendes is. And he ate Chad Mendes. Chad Mendes almost knocked out Alex Volkanovsky in Chad Mendes' retirement fight. People forget that. Like Volkanovsky was seriously hurt. He had to come back against Chad Mendes. Chad Mendes hits hard. Connor was never hurt by Chad Mendes on the feet. Uh, obviously, Jose Aldo didn't have a chance to hurt him. But the reason why Habib caught him is he was outside, and then he suddenly moved. And it, Connor was, thought it was going to be a shot because he sh- he's throwing a looping punch from far distance, not really what Habib's known to do. And Connor drops his hands to defend a takedown, and you get a looping right, you know, overhand right on anybody completely perfect. I mean, you know, Merkel Krokov, as I mentioned, like 
Kevin Random did the looping left hook. Mirko Krokop, former K1 champion, got knocked out. So, of course, Connor's going to get dropped with his hands right. down by his waist. But even then, he didn't seem like he was hurt by the punch, more off-balanced. All right, so here's the questions I got. Uh, there may be some redundancy to what you've already said. If so, I just want to, I want to work through them, and then we'll see kind of what we have here. First question is, and, and you can do this as, as a fight, or you can do this as a mixture of a lot of different things. What's the best version of Conor McGregor? What's, what's his best night? Uh, the best night was his last win against Eddie Alvarez. That was the one. Uh, j- the Jose Aldo one is obviously like, holy crap, he just knocked out Jose Aldo with the very first punch he threw, which is amazing. But there's also that, like, was it a lucky punch? Was What he did to Eddie Alvarez, where he just landed every single thing he threw, pieced him up, that he was, he was just – I mean, Eddie Alvarez had nothing for him. Eddie Alvarez, like every punch he threw, that's the one where I was like, oh, his vision, the vision, the vision. He saw everything that Eddie threw at him, just moved, just out of range, kept himself. It, it looked like it looked like a guy that would, you know, when you do the mat, the, the pads with your coach and, the, and you throw, and, the, you know, they know that, all right, all right, one, two, slip, left hook. And that's what it looked like. A guy like, all right, pop out, here's my slip, boom, left hook. Like he knew what was coming at him, and he was just so, that was the best I've ever seen Conor McGregor is that Eddie Alvarez fight. Yeah, and Alvarez isn't an easy guy to take out. I mean, Conor wasn't the first necessarily, but he's not an easy guy to take out. He's been in some wars. Him and Chandler went round and round for, you know. I, I think his, his, his first fight with, with Michael Chandler, it might be my favorite fight of all time. Right. I, I say, I'll, say, I'll go to my grave saying this. When people say Dan Henderson and Mercy Shogun is the best fight of all time, I say it wasn't even the best fight of the night. Eddie Alvarez <laughs> and Michael Chandler was on the same night. That's true. All right. Uh, let, let's shorten your, your, um, your, your rap sheet on, uh, on Connor and, and just break this down to where is he strong? It's on the feet, right? Yeah. On the feet, the range, the range is where he's the best. Like he, he's, he's great at keeping the shorter guys at bay. Obviously Jose Aldo, Eddie Alvarez, and then he's good at, getting in his desired range against the taller guys. Like, you know, Dustin Poirier is a taller guy. Nate Diaz, like, he's a master of range and, vi- and vision. I know it, it, I never realized how great Connor's vision was until I re- I just went through his, like, all his Jersey fights for this where we watched it and just a master of vision. And where he's weak, obviously the, the floor. I mean, we'll leave that aside because that's, that's a given. But, like, uh, on his heels, getting walked that's- down. Back. I've never seen him as a tremendous counterpuncher. I mean, he's got great accuracy, but that's not really, really where he feels comfortable. Well, no, no, no. I, I think he is a good uh, pressure counterpuncher, if you know what I mean. Like, yeah. he's very silly how Chris Cyborg is, where you're, you're pressing the action, you're coming forward, but drawing your opponent's punches at you. That's what he's a master. He's a master going forward, having them backing up, and then throwing, slipping, punching. Uh, what he's not great at, is having to circle back, even though he obviously he still has the power. Um, but that that uh, that would be a that's a big. I would say the cardio, the like conserving his energy because he throws power a lot. But we've only really we saw in the two Nate fights, and I think Nate's paid like, um, uh, yeah, I would say the cardio other than the ground, and I didn't like that he gave up his back against Nate. Yeah. So I mean. I, I want to find a more complex answer. Right. No. It's kind of. It's kind of like Fred said it on, on, on the not safe for work. Where like it's you kind of know what the weaknesses are with Connor. I was I was right. looking for something else, and I really couldn't find it. What's uh? How is he with his back to the cage? I feel like my memory of him is that he's not great. Is he able to get off? Uh. Well, I mean, not against Habib. No one's going to get off. I mean, that's. I mean, you get. Right. But Nate had him against the cage a little bit, right? Nate had him against. Yeah, and Nate's a lot bigger. Nate's rangier. Uh, he's strong. Like people have talked about how like surprisingly strong Nate is. So, it, but Cerrone's built similar to Nate. So, in the range could be an issue for. I mean, in the clinch, I mean, it could be an issue for Connor. All right. So let's talk about for Connor. What's Plan A? Uh, plan A would be go to the body a lot, work the body a lot, make, set up the left hand by working the body. I mean, Donald Cerrone has been hurt several, several times to the body. 
and that 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 is the area where I could see Connor because because Connor is a student of the game. I mean, that's thing he we've seen. He's talked about. He likes studying guys, and he'll study Don. He's got to study Don Cerrone. He's got to know the areas that, and the body has always been a problem for Don Cerrone. All right, and then what's Plan B? The kicks, leg kicks. Uh, I was very impressed with his his leg kicks, and I think that's an area that uh, Justin Gaethje was having a field day with with Cerrone with the leg kicks. That was his last fight. And Cerrone, think about this: two fights in a row, Cerrone has taken a lot of damage between Tony Ferguson and Justin. And obviously, a guy who's had as, as many appearances in the UFC as Donald Cerrone has, he's going to have. I mean, the damage is already taken its toll. Never mind after the two fights he just had. All right, let's talk about uh, does the best version of Conor McGregor beat Donald Cerrone on an average night? Like, not the best Cerrone, but not a bad Cerrone either. An average Cerrone, does the best version of Conor McGregor beat him? Then they, against an average Donald Cerrone? Yes. Yes. Okay. I know it seems like a weird question. I'm going to flip it here in a second. Okay. Um, and how far do you think Conor is from his best? Can we know? I, I, yeah, I don't know. We don't. He's not active enough. We have to see. We, we, to me, it has to be deep in the fight to know. The third round, fourth round. It, but it's weird because if he gets the third and fourth round, is he the best Connor? The best Connor should take him on the first round. Right. But I also want to see if he's fixed the cardio. Has he conserved, learned how to conserve his energy but still keep his power? Like, it, which is the – that's the thing with Tony Ferguson. It's like how does he, how does he stay as, as high pace he is – but as accurate as he is, as funky as he is, how can he keep that pace? Something that Colby Covington doesn't get enough credit for, like how you can keep that output. Can Connor keep a high output and still keep his power? That's something he's never showed. You know, he's, his energy, like most people, the deeper you go in a fight, he's going to lose power. Can Connor do that? I don't know. Next two things are my favorite two things that we've added to the show. Uh, one is a question, and one's more of just an area we're touching on. Uh, how will we know Connor's in trouble? First two rounds, how do I know Connor's in trouble? Or how do I know it's going to be a long night? If he gets taken down in the first round, I think it would be a long night. If he, I, if he gets taken down and he's, he's stuck on the bottom for a while, that could be, I mean, it, could, it could be a short night, actually, if he gets taken down, which we'll get into the breakdown of Don Cerrone. If he gets taken down and if he unloads on Cerrone and Cerrone is, you know, first two rounds and Cerrone's still battling, that could be a big issue. I think the other thing is that if, if Cerrone really gets committed to the leg kicks and we see Connor adjust to them, if he's switching stances, if he's That's at true. further distance, I think if, he, if we see him physically accounting for or either, you know, you and I talk about the distances and the range and where he's at. So either if he closes distance or if he gets further away, you know, the, old, the whole thing with Nate, like, oh, you're a wrestler now because mm -hmm. Nate was cracking him. Uh, I think that if we see him make an adjustment to the leg kicks, he's probably in trouble as well. Uh, the last thing. And he doesn't want to be, like you said, he doesn't want to be in that all the way in range. No. The last thing with Connor, um, let's talk about coaching. Uh, there's been some talk. He's, he's with Kavanaugh. Dylan Dennis is still present, but there's been a lot of talk of like Connor's his own coach. Even Kavanaugh says that, you know, the way the kind of guy Kavanaugh is though, that's he's, he's probably taking a piss when he says that he's not exactly saying it as a, as a compliment, you know, uh, the old saying of whoever has a, uh, has a, wants to represent themselves in court as a fool for a client, that kind of thing. That, so if, if, if Kavanaugh mm -hmm. is calling Connor the head coach, um, where, where are you feeling with Connor's coaching? I like that there's some consistency there, Yeah, but I just don't, I don't know. It's just tough because the, these athletes that are bigger than the sport, like obviously Michael Jordan had Phil uh, – what's his Jackson. Name? Phil Jackson. I almost said Phil Collins. Phil Jackson. Like, but Michael Jordan – he ran the play. He ran the team. Right. LeBron James has had a bunch of coaches. LeBron James is the coach of whatever team he's playing on. Uh, you know, th there's very few guys. I mean, I guess the, be the best example of a big megastar who has a coach that can kind of control him would be Belichick Brady. Yeah. But, I mean, obviously I'm from New England. Brady doesn't have that. Brady is the ultimate competitor, but he also is not, he's not a prima donna. It's, it's, well, it's, Brady's also committed to listening to Belichick as a byproduct of a greater good. So he's like, I got to let him, you know, he's got to, I got to let him lay into me every once in a while to, to prove the right. point we're trying to prove here. 
Yeah, and, and, and it's yeah, not a and, singular sport. And I don't think Brady's personality changed much from year one to year twenty. Right. Obviously, Connor it has. So, would he be good with any other team? Like, would it be any different? Like, if he went, like, who do you think, as a coach, demands the most, or gets the most respect from their athletes? As a coach, wow. like you know what I mean, or, or especially someone who's who has had the, the, the you know a star fighter, a fighter who's a top ten guy ever, or, or not that Connor is, but the, Connor is as for the star point has had that coach that meets. I mean, maybe Saint Pierre for us a hobby, maybe. Yeah, I mean, listen, there's a, there's coaches out there that I think would be good with Connor. I just don't know. I, I guess I'm not looking for another team for Connor. I'm just asking you if the team that he has now is as consistent as it was when he was great. And, and it, or do you feel like there's a departure from that? Because obviously I think Connor would be great with Mike Brown. I think Connor would be great with Greg Jackson. He'd have to be more of a team if yeah. he was there, and that's not who Connor is. So that aside, I'm just saying, who, do you think that this team is equipped for what Connor needs now? Are they as bought in as, if, as they've ever been? It's such a tough question because the th- good thing about the Connor camp is just centered around him. Not every fighter. You go to American Top Team, they're not going to be completely centered. Connor shows up, the entire fight camp is about him. So, yeah, I'm going to say he probably is the right team, and that's probably not a popular opinion. I think most people would not agree with that. But to have, like, Owen Roddy, who's, I think, a very good boxing coach, like, I think they did a very good game plan for the Mayweather fight. Like they did as good as they, they got the best out of Connor in that match that he possibly, you know, reasonably could expect. You know, I thought Connor blew me away with how well he did against Floyd. Mayweather. Now, some people say Floyd carried him. I don't believe that shit. I think Floyd was studying him, but I, I don't think he was carrying him. So, and, and I actually believe that he made adjustments. What Connor said, like, I expected this. And then he, when he changed that, I didn't have a game plan for step plan B, C, and D. And that's what makes Floyd Mayweather the master. So overall, yeah, I think it's a good team. Like I think having Dylan Danis as his basically his personal, I mean, you have one of the best just guys in the world. Say what you want about Dylan Danis, but have one of the best guys in the world as you're pretty much your judicial coach is good. Having Owen Roddy, a great boxing coach, as your coach is good. Um, so I think he needs what he is missing is that tough love mentor. I, I don't know if he has that. I don't know if right. John Kavanaugh. He may be. We, I mean, the only person who knows that is Kavanaugh and him. But to have that guy who would, you know. That he answers that, to. That could smack him upside the head and say, well, yeah. what are you doing punching this six-year-old man? What are you doing? Khabib has his father. Khabib you know, has his father. And he has Javier uh, uh, Mendez there. Um, yeah. Cormier. Yeah. Like, he has mentors in his life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so – yeah, I, yeah, Khabib's father is a perfect example. Like the way Habib talks about his father, does Connor talk to, about anybody like that? No, absolutely not. So, all right, let's move on to Donald uh, Cerrone. I think we cover Connor as well as we can. So, give me your scouting report on Cerrone. I mean, listen, you got a lot to draw from. He's been fighting for a long time, but he's pretty much consistent. I mean, as, as well rounded of as a fighter as he is, he likes to do similar things in the way that he enjoys fighting. So, let's talk about Cowboy. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm adjusting my 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 computer, which is not giving the video of people what they want. Uh, Donald Cerrone has great snap on his punches. That's what really steps. You know, he really has. He snaps those punches. Uh, great jab. That's probably his his best uh, strike. He does very well at mixing in his kicks and his punches together. He fights well from the kicking range. Um, he does well when he throws combinations, when he's really aggressive, knowing that he, you know, everything comes off the jab, but when he throws jab, kick, uh, high kick, jab, kick, uppercut, like when he mixes it all together, that's when he's really good. Now, the bad striking is I, I kind of agree with Chael Sonnen where he says that – I, well, let me back up. I, I kind of agree with Chael Sonnen when they say, I don't see any evidence that, that Donald Cerrone is a slow starter. I do see evidence that he's a slow starter. I just think it's been exaggerated. Uh, I think there's been one or two fights that happen with, and everyone keeps 
I was remembers that like versus the the Rafael dos Santos, the second fight against Rafael dos Santos is one that kind of jumps out where he did nothing in the open round and and it got kind of blown up. Um, he is a big target, and the biggest reason is he stands up very high, stiff, kind of like a Muay Thai fighter. Um, he doesn't like being pressured. He likes he he. Cerrone feels very comfortable in a distance kickboxing bout. Ally Aquinta started off very well against Donald Cerrone by pressuring. And then suddenly in the second round, he decides to completely change his game plan and lets Cerrone start leading the dance. And that's when he gets picked apart. Um, the Achilles heel is his body. He's had abdominal surgery. He's never truly recovered. He's been hurt to the body before. Um, Jorge Masvidal hurt him to the body. Dos Santos hurt him to the body. Gaethje hurt. Gaethje put him down with a body shot. Uh, he's been, um, oh, was it? He might him put him down, but he hurt him to the body. Um, he because he stands up so high, his leg kicks are open, which is what Justin Gaethje showed in the last fight. And the other offensive thing that he he doesn't lack true one punch knockout power. Now, of course, he's landed that high kick, which you know put down Matt Brown, put down. At some of those guys of that, but he doesn't lack one. You step into a punch and he's knocking you. I know he's dropped guys with punches, but he's not a puncher. He's not a p- knockout puncher. Uh, Grappling, he is a. I was gonna say I wrote down earlier this week underrated wrestler, and then I started realizing everybody's calling him an underrated wrestler, so he must not be underrated. <laughs> so I'm just gonna put it like this: He's a good wrestler. He's like a, he's he's never get called a wrestler, but he takes down a lot of guys. Um, he's very good at winning scrambles all the way back to the days of WEC when he was going against uh, Benson Henderson. He like he's good at winning scrambles. He's a serious submission threat on top and on bottom. He, I mean, he pulls off triangles. He, I mean, that arm bar against Mike Perry. Uh, he's got he's hard to take down. Like he's not uh, guys have struggled to take him down. Eddie Alvarez struggled to take him down, and then I never thought this. I never thought he had a great cardio. And then I watched the Tony Ferguson fight, and I saw Tony Ferguson fighting at the most insane pace of anybody. And Donald Cerrone did not struggle with the pace. He, he got hit a lot. That's why he hurt him. He got hit, and he got, you know, he got cut up. He got his arm busted, a bunch of stuff. But he kept up the pace for Tony Ferguson, like, which was really surprised me. So while I, I would have said before that he probably has pretty good cardio, I'm going to say actually he has really good cardio. So that's, that's kind of my rap sheet on Donald Cerrone. All right, then let's get into the questions, same as they were for um... – Oh, one more thing. Sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you there. No. The, other, the last thing I, I, I didn't mention is since, since Connor last won a fight, which is the Eddie Alvarez fight, Donald Cerrone has fought 11 times. And, and during that same fight, Connor has fought once against me, not counting the Floyd Mayweather fight. So a big advantage he's had is he's not rusty. Connor could be rusty. So that's the other advantage that, that Cerrone has. Well, and I, and I kind of want to get into that because – and I'll have a little bit of a pushback to that, which is that he's always been active. So whatever he has ever been is what he is now. Now is that better than what Connor is is the question. So, yeah, he's active, but he was active when he was getting his ass whipped too. No, that's so, true. That's very true. You know what I'm saying? So, okay, we got to – Travis Fulton is – Travis Fulton is as active as anybody – He's still a tomato guy. Yeah. Exactly. All right, so let's move on to the questions. What's, what's the best version of Donald Cerrone? What was his best night? His best night. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change. I'm going to say rounds two through five of Ally Quits. Recently. I'm not going to go way back. But of recently, you know, like obviously he had the Edson and Barbosa win. That was a great win. But the best Donald Cerrone, I mean, the Eddie Alvarez one back in the day was, was a pretty solid one. But rounds two through five of Ally Quinter was the one that really was jumping off the, off the film work. And, I, and just for the record, I said I watched all of Conor McGregor's fights in the UFC. I did not watch all <laughs> 110 of Donald Cerrone's. What's, uh, where's he strong? Um, his kicks, the way he mixes in his kicks. That, um, the way he, he disguises his kicks – a lot of his kicks, he just – he has great dexterity in, in his, his, his hips, the way he can just flick the kick up to head and way he – and when he adds kicks into his combinations, 
that's when Cerrone is feeling it. When Cerrone's feeling it is when you see the punching combinations added him with the kicks. That's when he's finding it. When he through. finishes him off with a kick, yeah. Either finished or even mid kick. Um, was it the Rick Story one where he knocked it? Like he hit that like one of the best combinations. He hit like a four punch combination. Every Donald Cerrone highlight you always see that one. Yeah, like, that might be the most impressive. But I guess a higher quality opponent than one with when he started over, he was throwing combinations at at Iron Quinta. Refresh my memory. How is he a kick into the body? Because in my mind's eye, I, I, I know good. the leg kicks. I know the high no, he's kicks. Good. He's good. He does a front kick to the body. He like he, he likes to use the push kick, you know, or the cheap kick. Like he's good. He's good. The Cerrone's good at all areas with the kicks. All right. Where's he weak? Uh, again, pressured. He does. He uh, he's yeah. He doesn't like when a guy's coming at him and he's getting forced to foot off his back foot. He doesn't like to brawl. That's never been Cerrone's thing. He doesn't want to sit in the pocket and throw down. And that's not Connor's area, too, but if that, that happens, that favors Connor. You know, it's interesting. We talked about when we were breaking down the Usman uh, Covington fight, how, you know, we, I don't know if we've said it in these terms, but it was kind of what we're beating around the bush of was it was the, you know, the old wrestling thing, right? The immovable object and irresistible force, what was going to give. I think this is a better stylistic matchup than people are kind of giving. I mean, this fight makes sense in a lot of different ways. And like you said, if, if Cerrone's weak getting pressure, well, Connor's a pressure fighter. Mm-hmm. If Cerrone's strong kicking legs, Connor hates that. So I, I think there's definitely yeah. some space here where we, there, there could be a hell of a fight. You know, I think that, that people have sort of resigned themselves to what their beliefs are, and no one's really said yet. And we may be getting to this when it comes time for our predictions here in a second. We got more Cerrone stuff for you, but – you know, who's to say this is, isn't going to be Adesanya Gastelum? Who's to say this isn't going to be it McDonald be. And, uh, and Lawler? You know what I'm saying? This could be one of those fights. I, I mean, obviously, Connor did, did it with Nate. So, all right, uh, what's plan I mean, A for Cowboy? Just writing off Donald Cerrone, it, to me, is crazy. Be, being that – oh, so, well, I'll get into that right here. Plan, plan A is – I think is take, take Connor down. Hope, having Connor – overextended a punch, shooting a takedown and get him to the ground. And I don't see Cerrone holding Connor down and beating him up with ground and pound like Mendez did, like Habib. What I see him is jumping on a submission. Connor's trying to scramble up and there's Cerrone. That is his best avenue. You know, I'm going to give you a weird comparison here. And, and we haven't talked about this before, but a lot of fighters are what I call um, – Wilt Chamberlain's, right? And, and the thing that's amazing about Khabib is he's a Shaquille O'Neal. And this is the difference between Wilt Chamberlain and Shaquille O'Neal. Because uh, I know a lot about basketball history. Wilt Chamberlain almost was apologetic about the fact that he was the biggest guy on the floor and would go out of his way to make things more fair. Shaquille O'Neal got the ball down low and dunked on your head and then threw it at you. So the thing I admire about Khabib, <laughs> I, go. and I'm going somewhere with this, so, so bear with me. The thing I admire <laughs> so, about Khabib... Hold on, hold on. If anybody had... Wilt Chamberlain reference on our on our bingo tonight. Good for you, man. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> um, so no, but the thing about Khabib is he has this one advantage and he goes right to it and does not relent from it. He's like, this is what I do. Now, this is why I'm bringing this up. Because Donald Cerrone sat down with Brett Ak- Akimoto and Brett Akimoto asked him straight out, are you going to take Connor down? And he said, I probably should, but I probably won't. Now, the thing that I think is missing and why you have to admire Khabib for a lot of different reasons, but this is one of the ways, and we'll move this back to Cerrone after I give pay Khabib this compliment, which is he probably won't take Connor down, Cerrone. And it's like when you're a fighter, Khabib does not want to win this fight. No matter what comes with winning the fight, that way he just doesn't. And he even said in the interview, he goes, I might be stupid, but it's my stupidity. Who's to say this guy can outstrike me? That If that's what... Cerrone wants to hang his cowboy hat on is that I can outstrike Connor and it's ultimately his demise. That's his decision to make. So I think that's where this fight does get interesting because yes, he probably could win a, win a, uh, a match on the ground with Connor very easily. That's not what he's looking to do. And all this Cerrone got paid off and blah, blah, blah. And there's a gentleman's agreement to stand. No, there's a gentleman's agreement that he wants to get in a fight with Connor McGregor and he doesn't think taking him down is getting in a fight. And I think that's my, that might be what we see. I mean, I think that makes this fight interesting. interesting. I, I don't know if he can take Connor down. Uh, I put it at like 50 50. Like, okay. I don't want to, like, it's not Chad Mendez. Right. You know, 
but uh, I think it's a little bit, well, I said that Cerrone's wrestling is underrated, which to the point it's probably not underrated anymore. Connor's wrestling is a little underrated where people, there's, there's like, oh, there's always like, everything in Connor is always two extremes. Anybody who, anybody who says that Connor has great takedown events, shut up. Like he doesn't have great takedown events. He got taken down by Nate Diaz. He got, uh, you know, like, he got judo tripped by Nate Diaz. He got, I mean, Chad Mann has turned into a, a wrestling dummy. Habib took him down. Like, he doesn't have great takedown defense. But anybody who's like, he sucks at wrestling is also going the other extreme. Like, he's, he's, he's solid. He's a solid, got solid takedown defense. He's not great. But Cerrone's a, I'm very impressed by his wrestling. What's plan B? Um, well, plan B is, I think, just stay at the kicking range. And, and they'll talk, people will talk about that Connor has a longer striking range. I think plan B would be, you know, longer with his hands. Cerrone has longer legs, and he can kind of kick, kick, stay out there. Uh, but I think the I didn't mention about plan A and plan B, both of them is to survive the early portion of the fight get into the deeper portion of the fight, start taking over with the cardio, with, the, with an output kind of thing. Kind of where Connor will start off fast and slow down. Cerrone might take the other approach, slow, start off slow, and, and start hitting the accelerator as each round goes by. That's, that's planned. You know, that goes with plan A and plan B. Okay, here comes the flip of the question I asked you earlier. Does the best version of Donald Cerrone beat and on his game – but not but average Conor McGregor. Conor on not an off night, but not a perfect night. Can the best version of Donald Cerrone beat him? So so could the best version of Donald Cerrone beat the Conor that lost to Nate the first time? Yes. Would you say that's yeah, I think he could uh, could he? Yeah, I think he could. You're having it again. Listen, for me, I don't know. I think that he's on a I think that a, that a Connor on an off night still pull. I think Cerrone, as talented as he is, and we'll get to that here in a second. As, so as there's your we, prediction. <laughs> well, kind of, because but we don't know what we're going to get. We don't know if we're going to get the best of Cerrone. So um, I, oh, yeah, I that's think, true. That's true. I think that the best Connor beats an okay Cerrone. I think the best Cerrone does not beat an okay Connor. I think Connor could get through Cerrone. Um, well, he, that kind of flies in the face of what I've been saying. So I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll have to get to our prediction here in a second. And, uh, and go from there. Now, here's the other question. How will we know uh, Cowboy's in trouble? <laughs> if he's unconscious. Uh, that, 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 uh, if Connor's going – if Connor's just having his way in, early in the fight where he's sliding out of proportion, you know, out of, ev- out of every single thing, landing combinations, landing to the body, sitting on his punches, ha- you know, rocking him. If, if, if – that's, that's the number one way Connor's uh, – Excuse me, uh, Cerrone's in trouble. The second way is if we start getting to the second, third, fourth round, and Connor's not tiring, Cerrone's in trouble. I think if okay. Connor can get cardio to the bottom. Sorry, cardio okay. is a very, very important for, for Cerrone to win this fight. Other than what I think is a quick submission or that switch kick, switch kick, high kick that could catch Connor. I think how effective Connor is to the body will let me know if Cowboy's in trouble. And I think if Cowboy. Um, if Cowboy's bleeding in the first, it might be a long night. Not that he can't handle a little bit of blood early, but I think if that that's going to show me that Connor's landing, you know, if his if his nose is showing some blood, if his eyes showing some blood, either cut or or it's starting to swell, I think that that Cowboy might be in trouble because it's showing that Connor's got his his range together. Because my my biggest concern with Connor is his range in this fight. And I think that if he's found his range in the in the mid to to late first, I think Cowboy might be in trouble. Coaching for Cowboy. Listen, I, I watched a little bit of the countdown show. So he's got this uh, strength and conditioning uh, chick that's out there at the BMF ranch. She seems like she's pushing him. Yeah, uh, he's, got Joe, he's got Joe Schilling, and he's got this guy. Um, I don't want to butcher his name. His wrestling guy is – The Jafari guy. Jafari. Yeah, Jafari yeah, he's been Veneer, coach for a while. Yeah, Veneer, yeah, yeah. He's been his coach for a while. Okay, so – how do you feel about his his team? I mean, listen, Veneer himself said that. Listen, when you're when you're in Cowboys camp and when you're in Cowboys guys, you'll be ready to go at a moment's notice. Um, how how well will being will having Schilling as a partner in terms of stand up help him with Connor? 
Well, he's been with them for a long time, so it, yeah, he's been with them a long time. So I don't know if it really has made that big of a difference now. Right, whatever he I, is, he's I, been. I also, I, if you think about the way the camps go with Donald Cerrone, it seems like kind of very similar to to Connor. Donald's in charge, I and mean, his his his. I mean, it's his facility. Uh, people come to him. So he's in charge. Even though he might have strength and conditioning coaches, he might have wrestling. He, at the end of the day, if he wants to take the day off to go uh, hand gliding or whatever crazy thing that Donald Cerrone will do that day, uh, go wrestle a shark, then that's what he's going to do. Um, but on the flip side, I don't know if a, like a strategy and stuff really matters or, or a camp. Because he seems like a guy who's like always in camp. Because he'll fight anybody in a week's notice. Yeah. Like, I feel like he seems like a guy. Connor doesn't seem like the guy who's always training. Like, Cerrone just seems. And, and I could be talking about him. I don't know. You know. I don't hang out with either one of them. I just put their personalities from the behind-the-scenes stuff. It just seems like if it's Tuesday night, there's a very good chance Cerrone's sparring with somebody, you know, or, or, or he fights this Saturday, and then Sunday he's sparring somebody just because that's Donald Cerrone. Right. Well, and the other part of it is, you know, connor has got the FU money now. So Cerrone's like, I like to, I'm going to go buy my, I'm going to fill this BMF ranch with snowmobiles. So I got to go fight. I'm going to I'm gonna buy a paintball yeah. guns for, so I got to go fight. So I think he stays ready because he enjoys it. That's his lifestyle. But also, you know, he has to, yeah, he don't got that Floyd Mayweather money in his bank account. Yeah. He's got to still go out but there and grind it out. I'm hoping he gets a big paid on this. So he has some nice snowmobiles and, and, uh, jet skis or whatever crazy things he wants to buy. Um, but I think generally speaking, it's a good camp for him just because he's the center of attention. And that there's people, I mean, he's good quality guys. And Joe Schoen's a fantastic kickboxer and, and whatnot. And as far as I know, the Jafari Rainier guy is a good coach. I mean, I don't know, but I mean, he's had good results. All right, then let's get to it. It's prediction time. But you've already kind of – you want to give yours first because you kind of already give it – Yeah, point. I'll give mine first. Um, and listen, the reason why, why I like to go first and you should always go second is because you take this – you really are concerned with who you think might win. You put a lot of thought into it. I'm a narrative <laughs> guy. I want yeah. Connor to win. I will find a – because of what it means for the sport, what it means for our brand moving forward, what it means for my interest in the sport and what we're going to produce moving forward. Listen, MMA is more interesting when Connor's around and doing well. So, um, for me, I think that he finds the range early, finds Cowboy's chin in a big way in the second, and finishes him in the third. That's my prediction. Wow. So, my prediction is I, I'm trying to figure out – I'm picking it earlier than you. I'm taking Connor. I'm going to take him first round. I, I think he's – I'm expecting a big year from Connor. I, if you listen to the Between the Links, I think it was two weeks ago, we were making our prediction for Fighter of the Year, and I picked Connor as the 2020 Fighter of the Year, which I guess would fall into that Connor nut hugger thing, which is, is funny because I remember spending hours bef- before the Chad Mendez fight, like uh, saying that Connor wasn't that good. Uh, I think Connor, between his vision, the, the history of, of Cerrone being being a hittable guy, the fact that Connor does work the body and the uh, and the damage that Cerrone has taken, I think Connor comes out. I think I think we see vintage Connor. I think Connor takes him on the first round. Interesting. All right. Well, and one more thing, guys, before we move on to round five, I want to touch base on one more thing, just because I forgot, and I want to talk to you about this real quick, and then we'll fix it all up in you know the post production. Um, I you know just leave it, just leave it raw. <laughs> Coaching. Listen, we're a professional outfit. We got to get this stuff right. Uh, all right, so let's move on to what's next. Um, so obviously, the winner of this fight is going to headline UFC Greensboro. That has got to be the <laughs> next move. Uh, and if you is... don't get that joke, listen to Between the Links. Um, so what's next? Can we, can we can we do this? So this to me, this this four categories. You have Connor wins, Connor loses, Cerrone wins, Cerrone loses. Okay. Cerrone loses to me. It's anybody. It's the same old Donna Cerrone fighting whoever. Fight in USC Greensboro versus Ismail uh, Makhachev there. Like, he could fight anybody. If Cerrone wins, his stock rises. I came up with three names. Okay. Nate Diaz, because, you know, to be the, you know, totally banking in on the casual fans. I think Colby Covington would be fun at welterweight. 
because of the conflict of of personalities and whatnot. And then the other person I thought about would be Dustin Poirier. That's interesting. And you it's don't funny, think any of three, this of the three, I actually think so, the guy that probably makes most from the ranking sense, Poirier I actually would be the least one that they'd pick of those three. You don't see a fight with Jorge Masvidal happening? And obviously, he's got the BMF belt. Donald's got the BMF ranch. Donald beat Cowboy. I mean, um, Donald would have beat Connor at this point. Does that fight make sense um, to you? Or do you maybe. think Masvidal's in another stratosphere? If you're Masvidal, well, I'm, I'm gonna, I, listen, I got I, – Keith, we don't do this game enough. It's, I'm stealing this directly from Bill Simmons. He does it with he, when he proposes trades. Here we go. Jorge Masvidal, Donald Cerrone, which camp says no? I, I, I was running episodes now, so the Jorge, Jorge, Jorge <laughs> I Masvidal. forgot about that. Damn it! It ruined the whole game. <laughs> I mean, it could have been it could have been Godzilla or Donald Cerrone. Who says no? Godzilla. <laughs> like, uh, um, Godzilla. I know what you're saying like, who does it make sense for more? No, uh, which which yeah, which 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 camp would say no? There's a better fight out there for. Him. Let me put it to you that way. No, no, he won't say no. Which camp says there's a better fight for me? To me, we have to see what a win over Connor does for Cerrone. Does it take him? Is it? I mean, it's going to re- make him go high. Even just facing Connor, his stock rises just by facing with the casual fans. But does he beat Connor in a convincing way? Does he knock him out? Does he win in a huge combination? When he gets in the mic, does he say the perfect thing like Jorge Masvidal did? Did we get him on Sports Center saying funny things? Do does you know does does the next you know Sunday Sports Center they have some Sports Center anchor going out on jet skis with Donald Cerrone and sitting by? the water having a conversation afterwards. Like, does all these things happen, you know? Does he end up on Jimmy Fallon doing some kind of funny prank on somebody? You know, like, does that, all these things happen? If all those things happen, then Jorge Mato doesn't turn out. But if it's just a win that doesn't go past a little bit and rising his stack, then I, st- I think, I think uh, Masvidal goes after the title instead. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people have said this doesn't really feel like a Connor fight week, and I get that sentiment. I think I, – I personally tweeted out this week, I think Connor has a, a media strategy for this week, and he doesn't want to burn anything early. I think he's really focused on the fight. That's part of it as well. But I think part of the reason why Eddie Alvarez, Nate Diaz, all those guys got a little bit of a push when they fought Connor was the lead-up. Nate Diaz and Connor were on CNBC. Yeah. Like, they were everywhere. I'm so you're right. We do need to see what happens after this fight with Cowboys Cerrone. I'm starting to hear it a little bit more. Like like national championship was last night, and they had the ads for the fight and stuff. But you're right. It is, does not have the same buzz. The press conference tomorrow, I, I kind of needs to open up a little bit. This this this. They're going back to what we said earlier, all the way back in the very first. They started by insulting each other. Now they're complimenting each other. Where Cerrone was standing at basically like, I'll fight Connor. It'd be an honor to fight Connor. And, yeah. and Connor saying, like, <laughs> excuse me. No, I like him. He's a family guy. You know, the way he takes care of his grandmother. And it's weird, like, man. Oh. I think they do like each other. And that gets funky. You know, Chael Sonnen talks shit to everybody except for Brian Stan. When he fought Brian Stan, there wasn't really much to say. And I think it's because wow. he respected him. Yeah. But, I, but my point is, is that I think that this, uh, there's a little bit of respect between the two of them. Now, listen, Connor could come out tomorrow. I completely blow that out of the you know out of the water by by having this whole thing set up and ready to go. I think that he still wants to prove that he's this, still this bankable star, and that uh, I think he's gonna have some stuff for us in the next couple of days. Yeah. Uh, but let's talk about you know we have a we have a really stacked couple of divisions here. So you gave me the the scenario if Cerrone loses. You gave me the scenario if Cerrone wins. What happens if Connor loses? It's got to be the Nate fight, right? Okay. So I wrote down. Now I I tried coming up with every scenario I could. So I came up with five possible opponents. Okay. The one would be go – I have two that I say these are the two that if they still want to hold higher, like still give Connor marquee names. The DS trilogy it would be the most obvious one. The DS trilogy I think fits in both categories. The, he, the, Connor and Diaz is going to fight one more time. The other one that I think if they want to get him in a big name would be kind of Colby Covington. Yeah. And at 170. Then the next year, Hound, I said, well, these are the ones that would make sense in a ranking sense now. And I'd said the winner of Paul Felder, Dan Hooker. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a main event. So they're gonna, the name's going to go up a little bit. And then a, the other one I came up with 
and this is kind of going with a you know ranking sense, but also a, a, a different angle, is Islam Makashev kind of re-stirring up the Connor versus the whole Habib camp thing, the brawl thing, you know, like going that angle, the Muslim versus Connor, the Connor versus like all that. Right. Yeah. If it, but the UFC might not want to touch that. And then if you want to go way back, you want to say, guys, we got to get this guy a wing. You know, he lost to Floyd. He lost to Habib. He just lost to Cerrone. Here it comes. We this guy. If we need to get this guy a win. If you want to go all the way down that, go all the way to Joe Duffy. Who I knew it. it was coming. I said – You and this Joe Duffy fight, you're never going to let it die. He's got a win over – I'm saying – no, I'm saying this is like the very least likely – this would not be – people would be pissed off. It would probably be Connor headlining an ESPN card. Not even not, – not, not ESPN plus. Right. Yeah, not UFC Fight Pass. I mean, like, the big ESPN. But you're, like, ultimately – like, when they gave him Dennis Seed. Like, all right, we need a win. We didn't win him in the main event. Let's get him a win. We get Dennis Seed. That's how I feel the Joe Duffy thing would be. Okay, now with a win. Does he go 70 or 55? Dude, I, okay, so I got a million. I got a million ones first. So um, the, the, the ones I say, like, you're going with the highest ones. The highest one would be what, what, what – uh, Dana White is saying in, in fight, fight, fight Habib. That'd be the, obviously like the highest one. You could do that. The other one would be Tony Ferguson if he wants. Um, the second one would be Fight and Usman. You jump the line, Fight Usman. So those are, and then the, other, the last one of the, the highest of high would be Jorge Masvidal, which I think a Conor win would probably be the one that's going to happen is Jorge Masvidal. I think that's probably the fight they're going to do. Then I have the one that's like, all right, he got a win. He keeps talking about a season. If you look, if you're looking, if the UFC looks at it the same way Connor does as a season, where at the end of the season is the Super Bowl. That's where we're trying to get. They're not trying to rush him. Maybe the Woodley Leon Edwards winner, if they want to keep him at 170. Yeah. Tony Ferguson coming off a lot. If Tony Ferguson loses to Habib, that could be it. Um, but he's not going to fight Habib if Habib loses, because what's the point? Um, Colby Covington again I still think fits in that one like I think Covington could fit either way win or loss and then another one uh, the other, the, obviously the, I already said Diaz the trilogy and then Dustin Poirier that they've, they've kind of talked about they've been interested in fighting again and then I have like the, the ultimate like alright we want to try to get him another win is the, he never fought RDA like they were supposed to fight each other yeah. do RDA at this point I really feel like that would really favor Conor but so here's what I got, and, and I love everything you just said, except for the matchups. I think there's a lot of unfavorable matchups for him in there. I think if he's going to go into a fight with a severe disadvantage against someone, like he has against Khabib, it should be Kamaru Usman because he's already lost to Khabib. So what I would do if I was the UFC is if he beats Cerrone, you want to talk about the season. Here's the season. And this is the way to maximize your Conor profit. He beats Cerrone. He fights Masvidal at International Fight Week, and he fights Kamaru Usman in Brooklyn in November. Okay. That, 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 to me, is maximizing the money you can make from Conor. And with Masvidal, you get a favorable matchup because Masvidal is going to stand with him. So, for me, that's, that's the only path. Yeah. Now, so I, I agree would... with – the only thing – the only, the only change to that would be I would, I would do Kim against Gaethje at International Fight Week if I was trying to set up Khabib. Okay, so what, what, what I want to just make clear, I was just given all the possible options. Right. No, I understand. Yeah. That, I that makes you. sense. I wasn't just throwing out anybody. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I got you. And then what I think happens is Jorge Masvidal. Okay. If I am the guy, I'm looking at it the same way Connor. I'm looking at it as a season. And I'm going to try to give him favorable matchups, but still that you could benefit if he loses. So I would go, obviously, Cerrone. He beats Cerrone. I like the Nate Diaz trilogy. I think that's a very winnable fight for Connor. Then I like Justin Gaethje. He wins that, Justin Gaethje. Now back to Habib or, who, or Tony, whoever's the champion. Here's going to be where we come into Back's agreement. The this road. Here's where we're going to come into agreement. And this is where I think we're going to get out of this podcast. Last thing, my last question for you, the last words I want uttered on this podcast, other than what, how great our network is. If Connor wins, and this is going to tell us everything, if Connor wins, who does he call out in the cage? I'm going to answer that in one second. One thing that's crazy we didn't talk about is that this fight's at 170. 
We didn't even talk about that. Yeah, that's true. Not, it's not even a story anymore because Connor fight anyway. Yeah. Um, and the reason why I went the path, you went 170, you went 170 path, I went 155. It's just because I think 155 is a better weight class. I think eventually a size advantage will, will hurt him. And I think there's worse matchups with Usman, with Covington, maybe even Leon Edwards. Like there's worse matchups. So I agree with you. Here's the only place I disagree with you. I think Usman's a better matchup than Khabib. And I think that he'll, he'll, he, if he fought Usman and he won, he'd never defend the belt. I think he should never fight Khabib again. I mean, I understand the financials of it all, but I think that he doesn't want anything to do other than cleaning that up. I get it. Yeah, Listen, he's a competitor. I, he's a competitor, and he has to fight Khabib to clean up that record. But if I was him, I'd, I've said this a thousand times. I'd fight Masvidal. I'd fight Usman. Get that 70 belt. I, 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 no shit. I know he said that he doesn't care about it. Yeah. If I fought uh, Masvidal in International Fight Week, that BMF title would be on the line. Yeah. And if I fought Usman, the 70 belt be on the line. At the end, you just say, listen, 45, 55, BMF, 70, what's left? So I'd go fight Manny Pacquiao or whoever. Yeah, so, so I'm going to answer your question in one second because I know you'll say you want to end it. All right. I, I agree that I think he'd be might be a worse matchup than Usman. The problem is I'm saying there's like two, three, four possible bad matchups at 170 where I think for I mean, there's guys who could beat him at 155, but the only one I'm like, this is a bad matchup is to be. That's why I think still 155 is, is the better way for us to go. So to answer your question, who does he call? He probably calls out a whole bunch of people. He probably mentions, I'm here, I'm back, I'll fight anybody, Gaethje, this and But if he, if he only calls out one person, if he does, I'm making one call out, Jorge Masvidal. I agree. It's Jorge Masvidal. I think if that's only goes. one person. I expect him to call out everybody. I, I think Jorge Masvidal, and this is going to sound horrible because of the run that he's on, I think Jorge Masvidal is the most beatable fighter out there with the biggest profile. I think he calls him out. I think the fight makes sense. I, I, it's, I, it's a very fascinating matchup, Jorge Masvidal and Conor. Uh, yeah. All right, guys, there you have it. It's a wrap on the fifth episode of All Angles. Make sure you subscribe and like us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and now YouTube. Be sure to also listen to all the other content on the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network, including the Not Safe Work Podcast with Kyle Steele and Fred Curry between the links hosted by Mike Heck and starring an all-star cast of writers from around MMA, including Keith Schillen, including Davidson Baker, including Craig Allen. The Loudmouth MMA Recap Show, which will be a great one with Keith and I, uh, post this fight, the breakdown show with Max and Marcel, MA yesterday with Kyle Steele and Keith Schillen, the MA takeover with Keith Schillen, which was a fantastic, well formatted show. I love it. Uh, and also, there's some other stuff coming. Do you there's, care there's to speak on any of that? There's a new show getting taped right now as we speak. Let's talk right about now. it. It's a roundtable style show. It is not between the links where there's four people arguing, it's four people just discussion. Um, I know. Craig and Mike is on it. Kyle Steele is on it. And a new member of the team, Drake Riggs, is on it. I'm not sure if he's permanent. I think he might be permanent. I should, probably shouldn't say that publicly. but oh, <laughs> He well, should hey, be. I've well, done some hey, podcasts hey, with Drake in the past. If Drake, if Drake isn't, it's on him. And if you listen to him, tweet at him and say, hey, Drake, be permanent. There you go. Keith he's can be fantastic. followed at Keith Schill MMA. I can be followed at SM Cornerman. That's it, guys. It's a big one as always. We'll talk to you on the recap show afterwards. And uh, there you have it. Peace. <laughs> We'll